Uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, we are continuing our series of uh, events that I hope will bring Kyrgyzstan closer to the developed world and its values. Uh, and thank you very much, Charles, for joining us. I think it's, uh, it's, it's a very logical continuation to your public activity in Twitter, in Facebook. We see you everywhere. We see you in Talas. We see you in Alarcha. We see you in uh, Alameddin Bazaar, where we don't see each, uh, uh, ourselves for, for tens of years. And uh, um, yeah, so we decided to do it a different way. Uh, usually I was introducing, but tonight uh, Charles want to, wants to introduce himself. And uh, let's start with this. Thank you very much, Danya. It's, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. And thank you all so much for coming. Um, I love opportunities like this because um, it is an opportunity for me not just to say a bit about what Britain does, but also to hear a bit from you um, about, um, about the subjects that are important and interesting for me. So this is a great opportunity, and thank you all for coming, and thank you, Danya and Ololo House. And I'm especially pleased that it's in Ololo House. Um, I particularly like this place. For me, it's, it's not just bright and fun and creative and original. It's a real expression of, um, of, of what this country, of one aspect of this country. And, um, and for me, it's an expression of this country which is very optimistic for the future, very forward-looking, and, and, and one that I, I, I think Kyrgyzstan can be really proud of. Um, and congratulations on opening your new Ololo House, in fact, up on the Magistral as well. It's, it's success breeding success, I would say. So what I wanted to do this evening was just to say a few things. I'll, I'll speak for about 10 or 15 minutes um, to say a few things about myself. I'll introduce myself and, and, and who I am. I'll say a bit about why the United Kingdom, my country, has an embassy in Kyrgyzstan. It's not always obvious um, what we do or why we do it. Um, I'm then going to reflect on just a few aspects in very, very broad terms, no detail at all, very broad terms, about the kind of changes to the environment, the geopolitical environment that I operate in as a diplomat um, that have taken place since I started being a diplomat back in 1987. So you can imagine there's, there's quite a lot that's gone on since then. And I'll do that by way of introducing just three or four questions, again, very broad questions. Three of them will be about those geopolitical developments, and one of them will be more focused on this country as a way of kicking off the dialogue, because I, I, I really want this not to be me talking for a long time to you, but us all having a conversation. Um, so I'll, I'll start with myself. I'm, I'm Charles Edmund Garrett. I was born in 1963 in, in Helsinki, in Finland, because my parents at the time lived and worked in Moscow, and Finland was the nearest Western country, um, which in retrospect has given me a very warm feeling that I grew up for the first part of my life in Moscow, and therefore in the same country as Bishkek, or as it then was, Frunze. So I like to think of my coming here to, to work as a kind of return to the country that I first lived in all those years ago. Um, so that's um, me where I was born. I grew up in, in, in Moscow. I grew up in, in Bonn as well in Germany, which was then the capital of Western Germany, in Vienna, where my father worked for the United Nations, and also in the UK. And I, I, I spent time at boarding school in the UK before I went to university in London, where I studied Russian studies. I'd had my eyes opened to, to, to Russia and its wonderful language, its wonderful culture, its history, its, its fascinating politics and society by living in Russia. And I spent uh, four very happy years at London University and also partly in Moscow during that time. I then left university and I, I started working for a bank, um, which I very quickly realized I did not want to do. And I left the bank after 15 uh, very quick months and applied to join the Foreign Office. I knew I wanted to work overseas, partly that's because I'd spent so much time in my childhood work, uh, living overseas. 
and, um, and, and that is what I wanted to do. So I was delighted to get a place in the Foreign Office. Um, the first thing I did in the Foreign Office, or the first thing the Foreign Office did with me, was to send me off to learn Chinese. And I spent a, a year at, back at London University, and then a year in Hong Kong learning Chinese, before I went on a posting to Hong Kong, where I was on the team which negotiated the transfer of, of Hong Kong from Britain to China. Uh, a fascinating part of my life where you really felt the hand of history on your shoulder as you, as, as you went into to, to the negotiations. Um, apart from China, uh, from Hong Kong, I've also worked in, in Taiwan, and that's very much my sort of East Asian um, experience. Um, the rest of my career in the Foreign Office has been in Europe, apart from my current posting, where I've worked in Cyprus and Switzerland, and most recently where I was ambassador in Macedonia, um, which I, I finished last year, in the middle of last year, before preparing to come out here. Um, apart from that, my career was interrupted uh, deliberately by uh, a secondment out of the Foreign Office to the organising committee of the London 2012 Olympic and Paralympic Games, which took place, as you probably remember, in 2012. I joined them for three years before that to, to, as, as head of international relations and had an absolutely fantastic and fascinating and, and developmental time there before returning to the Foreign Office and my job as ambassador in Skopje. Um, outside work, I have a family. My wife, Veronique, is, is here in the audience. Um, and um, and the, the two of us are, are blessed with five children. Um, the eldest is 27 and the youngest is 19. And so they're, they're all either out of the home or on their way out of the home. Um, but Veronique and I have very quickly realised that, um, that that moment where you think that your responsibilities end is actually the moment where your responsibilities continue and just become more expensive. So, so, so that's, that's kind of where we are. Family is very important to us. Um, so for me, are mountains, and Kyrgyzstan is a wonderful place to indulge that. Cycling, again, it's a wonderful place to indulge that. And football, and of course football is a global product now, so I can spend quite a lot of time here um, indulging myself with that. So that's me and, and, and my family, inside work and outside work. Um, I said I'd say a bit about why um, Britain has an embassy here in Kyrgyzstan. Well, the last person in this chair was Monica Iverson, the German ambassador. You've also had the Swiss ambassador. And those are two of only four European countries. So there are some 40 European countries in total, and only four of them have an embassy here. Apart from Germany and Switzerland, it's France and the United Kingdom. So you might think that's a slightly strange choice to come to, to Kyrgyzstan when everyone else decides not to come here. Um, my view, um, which, is, which is based really on Britain's approach to foreign affairs, which itself is based on a global representation where we try to be represented in, in as, as wide a range of countries as possible, is that you cannot properly cover Central Asian politics without having a presence in Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyzstan might be a small country in Central Asia, it might be one of the poorest countries in Central Asia, but in my view it's uh, one of the most interesting and certainly one with arguably more potential than any of the others for a lot of the things that really matter to the United Kingdom and I'll, I'll come back to that later on. So we're here really um, I think for three principal reasons which form the objectives of uh, British foreign policy. The first is, is prosperity. Um, when the United Kingdom works with other countries to develop prosperity and promote economic growth, then that produces opportunities for the UK. Everyone wins from that. It's a classic diplomatic win-win situation. So we're here to um, support British businesses who are investing in Kyrgyzstan, to help British businesses that want to do trade with Kyrgyzstan, but much more widely to work with Kyrgyzstan partners in order to develop the business sector here and increase and, and improve the business environment for businesses and to increase opportunities. And we do that in a range of ways through, through programs that the British Embassy runs from, for example, something called the Enterprise 
innovation programme, which is setting up business incubators uh, in, in, in towns across Kyrgyzstan. Um, it's going to open one very soon in Bishkek. It'll open another in Osh soon after that, and we hope for others um, across the country, probably four, five, or six in total. And that will help develop the business environment and help support small enterprises um, across Kyrgyzstan. Another is something we call the, the Policy Implementation Facility. And I'm sorry about these dreadful names. They don't mean anything at all. But what that does is that it works with the, uh, with the Kyrgyzstan government to take data and evidence which is based on data and use that to help the government to produce policies which really can help um, local business and help to stimulate the economy in Kyrgyzstan. And we do that, as I say, because what benefits Kyrgyzstan in this respect benefits the United Kingdom well, as well. It's a, it, it's a real collaboration. The second area is, is, is security. And this is something which, of course, concerns every single country. Um, for every government, arguably their first, their top priority has to be keeping, maintaining the security of the people, the individuals, of society, maintaining the security of the country. And of course that's not possible without collaboration in an international sense. We can't, we can't on our own in the United Kingdom ensure that security for ourselves. We have to collaborate with a very wide range of countries because the challenges to security are of course international. They, they come from other countries, they come from your own country. They're stimulated and incubated in other countries and the solutions of course have to come from collaboration between different countries. And we do a lot of that with the Kyrgyzstan government here. Um, we work with them in the international organizations at the United Nations through the OSCE as well. We uh, Agencies in the United Kingdom, for example, which are uh, working against um, organized crime, for example, collaborate with their opposite numbers here in Kyrgyzstan as well. There are many levels on, on, on which that goes on. We're also working through programs in the British Embassy to help develop the kind of environment where security can be uh, protected. And I think particularly of, of our work to help strengthen democracy in, in Kyrgyzstan. We, we see democracy as the very best basis for a fair and stable society, which of course is a good way to help protect um, security. Um, and we do, we do work as well in the field of rule of law as well, which has a similar impact. So those are the first two, prosperity and security. The third area is, is um, much smaller, but it's um, just as important, particularly to the individuals concerned. It's about protecting UK, business, uh, UK citizens here in Kyrgyzstan. We don't get many British people coming to Kyrgyzstan. At any one time, there may be 200 in the country, maybe up to 400 during the tourist season. But a lot of these people, I'd say two things actually. One, those numbers are growing. Every year we see more and more British people coming here, for, attracted by the beauty of the country and the opportunities of the country. And the second thing is that a lot of them come here to do slightly unusual and often quite dangerous things. They, they climb mountains, they go hiking in very remote places. I was talking today to a, to a, to a British entrepreneur who's based here in Kyrgyzstan who, is, um, who has set up a, a cycling race in Kyrgyzstan. It's called the Silk Road Mountain Race. It's 1,700 kilometers long and climbs over dozens of, of passes here. That is quite a, 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 a dangerous pursuit for the people involved and, and we often find ourselves having to respond to the kind of things that they're getting up to. So that's why we've got um, an embassy here because it helps us to um, promote those objectives, security, prosperity, and British citizens, which are important to us. Um, I would mention also um, a particular thing which I touched on at the beginning, and that is Kyrgyzstan's uniqueness. Um, the countries of Central Asia are, of course, all very different. The rest of the world makes a big mistake in talking about Central Asia does this or Central Asia does that. The five countries here really are very, very different from each other, is my experience as a British diplomat here. And one of the reasons why Kyrgyzstan stands out is it's the only country here which has made a serious effort to promote freedom of expression, 
to promote freedom of, of, of the media, democracy and rule of law. And although in all of these areas you can criticise what the situation is, you can say that people or the government need to do more, it has moved a lot further than any of the other countries in the region in, in that direction, which is a real opportunity for us. We want to help the other countries as well to develop in those areas. And using the Kyrgyz example is very useful to us. So, so that's an example of how um, Kyrgyzstan is unique and again why there needs to be a British embassy here. There are many other reasons as well. One is the Chevening um, Scholarship Programme, which we, um, through which we, we build connections between real people in the United Kingdom and real people in the countries where we're active. Kyrgyzstan sends some five, six, seven, eight students to do master's degrees in the UK under Chevening every year. And those are a very important part of the glue that brings our two countries together. So, so we're able to, to promote that too. So that's the first two things I said I'd talk about. The, the, the second two were, how has the world changed since I've been a diplomat? And then, promote, then, then offering you a few questions. So how has the world changed? I became a diplomat um, in 1987. Um, that was before the end of the Cold War. So, so that's one massive change that has already happened. Um, you might remember some of you who, who are old enough or who have researched that period since then, that it was at the time, in the infamous words of a, of a, of a US Japanese historian, um, described as the end of history. You know, life in the world is now going to be boring because nothing's going to happen. Well, certainly ideological struggle, struggles finished, um, and that offered the opportunity for the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, for example, to, um, to, to follow their own path r rather than one dictated from outside their country. It allowed European Union enlargement to happen. Um, but it produced a much, much more complex world, a, a world um, which is perhaps illustrated by the breakup of the USSR, just one example, but of course very relevant here in Kyrgyzstan. That breakup produced 14 countries which are all extremely different from each other. I mentioned the differences between Central Asian countries, but if you think of the difference between Turkmenistan, for example, and Estonia up in the, in, in the west of the old Soviet Union. The differences are extraordinary. So, so those differences themselves provide a much greater diversity of the ki kind of countries that are around in this new world. It's a, very, it's, a, it's a world in which there is either less alignment of countries with each other, certainly not in the old style of east, west, and the non-aligned movement, it's perhaps an area where there's less alignment, or perhaps it's just more complex alignment. In any case, it's a very different and, 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 and more challenging world. Second thing I'd mention here is the rise of China. When I was negotiating on the Joint Liaison Group over Hong Kong, uh, China was um, considerably poorer than it is today. It was considerably less assertive on the international scene than it is today. Um, it is th the fact that it has become richer is, of course, a very good thing, especially if you're one of those many millions of Chinese who have been lifted out of poverty. Um, but it produces different challenges. The way that China is using its, its own brand, its own developed technology to pursue its, its human rights or its anti-human rights agenda is a particular challenge. Um, and I would say probably a challenge for China, ultimately, as much as it is for other parts of the world. And its assertiveness is, is worth noting as well. That's an assertiveness not just, which takes expression not just in the way it behaves in the South China Sea, for example, um, where it is pursuing its own territorial claims with, with, with great uh, vigor, but also in, in much less troubling, but nonetheless complex areas like the Belt and Road Initiative, which of course is very much more relevant to a country like this. Um, that produces risks around debt, around um, the alignment of countries, but it also produces fantastic opportunities too. So, so there's the rise of China. The third, which I won't touch on, which I won't go into any detail in, is, is, is the internet. That's something which affects every individual in this room and all of us collectively, and it, in, it, and it influences the rise of China, it influences the way countries align, and many, many other things. The fourth thing I wanted to mention 
is that over 25 years, so less than the time that I've been working as a diplomat, one, more than one billion people have been lifted out of extreme poverty worldwide. This is a significant change in the world and it's having um, major influences, not just on commercial and economic connections around the world, but, but also, of course, on it, it, it's feeding um, geostrategic challenges like increased migration and the like. I remember when um, back before that 25 years of lifting people out of poverty happened, I rather naively took the view that as countries in Africa and Asia became richer, so migration would probably diminish because people would have the opportunities to develop their businesses at home where, where their families are and, um, and, and so would not look to, to move either legally or illegally to richer countries. But how wrong I was, quite the opposite happened. As people got a bit more money, and again with the influence of the internet, people saw the opportunities and they had the opportunity to pay smugglers or to pay for airline tickets to move around the world and to, and to stimulate, to be part of this massive new phenomenon of, of mass migration, either for reasons of, of, of seeking refuge, political refuge, or for seeking um, economic opportunities. And security has become much more complex. I touched on that earlier. Technology has become, of course, better than ever it was before, and that gives countries which want to protect their security many opportunities for, um, for, for doing exactly that. Um, but at the same time, I would say that another area which is essential to, to, to protecting security around the world has diminished, and that is international collaboration. The very thing that we are here to do, which is to collaborate with Kyrgyzstan, this has become much, much more difficult as countries don't collaborate in the same way through the international organizations in the way that we used to. A lot of, um, a lot of that you see in greater terror around the world, a lot of it you see, of course, in, in the wars. And, um, and I think that it's something that, that is very closely related to the migration that I was talking about earlier. So those are just a few things. There are many other things that are going on in the world. And I offer that just as a kind of appetizer, if you like, to the conversation. The four questions that I promised you as a way of, 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 of kick-starting the, 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 the question and answer session. Um, first one concerns climate change. There's absolutely no question that the climate is changing. There is also no question that that is changing um, the environment uh, in the widest possible sense for any country around the world. Some are being challenged existentially as sea, seas rise. Um, countries like Kyrgyzstan are being challenged across the board. Not only are the glaciers melting faster here than before, which of course affects your um, critical supplies of water, for agriculture and generating electricity. Um, of course, it'll change the economy, and that produces challenges as well as opportunities for people. But it's something we can't afford to um, ignore. So my question on climate change would be, what are the risks and opportunities for Kyrgyzstan in that area? Second question uh, is, where is Russia going? Um, Russia, of course, has been part of a lot of what I was talking about in geopolitical changes. Um, its re-emergence in the Middle East as a serious uh, player there, not only in Syria, but, um, but in other parts of, of the Middle East, is, is a relatively recent phenomenon. I mean, that goes back two or three years. E even more recently, we see, um, we see the, the leaders of well over half of Africa's nations gathering in Sochi, for a, a summit meeting with, with President Putin. This is another very powerful indication of, of, of what Russia's ambitions are on a global stage. So Russia, a really important strategic partner for Kyrgyzstan. What does Russia's re-emergence as a, as a global player, as a more assertive player mean for Kyrgyzstan? Third question is around the rise of China. Um, what does Russia's, what, what does China's increased international engagement through the Belt and Road Initiative and what does its uh, increased assertiveness that I was talking about in the South China Sea and elsewhere, what does all that mean for international politics and how can Kyrgyzstan benefit from that particular um, development? 
And then the last one, I promised you one on, on Kyrgyzstan. This is a very simple question. Um, where is Kyrgyzstan going to be in 10 years' time? And how will it get there? That's the second part of it. So, so those, are, those are four questions, three on geopolitics. One about what are the risks and opportunities of climate change for Kyrgyzstan. One about what the opportunities and, poten and, and, and potential risks, perhaps, of, of the re-emergence of Russia mean for Kyrgyzstan. The fourth one was about the rise of China and, um, and, and how K Kyrgyzstan can benefit from that. And the fourth is about Kyrgyzstan itself. Where is it going to be in 10 years' time and how is it going to get there? So that's, that's where I stop my opening piece. And, um, and, and, and I really look forward to the questions and answers. I've brought with me some um, small presents from the British Embassy. And I um, would be very glad to hand out um, those small presents one by one for each of the questions until the, que until the presents or the questions themselves have run out. So, so do please um, put your questions. So, do you want people to answer to your questions right now? Yes, why not? I mean, you know, co comment or questions actually. Yeah, I mean, is a, is, is, is a great idea. My name is Hachirok, I'm working as a Kyrgyz translator. You mentioned earlier about uh, Chinese writing in our country, so my question is about Chinese death trap policy or diplomacy. So as is, is you, is you already know, Chinese is kind of helping to our country by giving financial uh, credits, but uh, I think these financial credits are being used for improving social structure, like the construction of roads and this kind of stuff, uh, but uh, Kyrgyzstan's external debt, because of this credit, Kyrgyzstan's external debt is, the, the biggest part is to China. If I'm not mistaken, I yes. haven't checked it recently, but I think so. Uh, so what do you think uh, about this? How we could pay back this credit to China? in order not to lose our resources and the land. Thank you. Great question. I, I've got your present here, by the way, but you're going to have to come and get it because I'm trapped by oh, these oh, wires. OK, so that's, that's the first <coughs> one going <laughs> out. <laughs> so so my, my take on that um, is, is, is rather old-fashioned, actually. Um, of course, um, debt is necessary um, for development. There, there, there isn't a business alive today which has been able to grow without borrowing money. And, and likewise, you know, there isn't a country. Oh, there is. OK, so I, I was mistaken. You can. Yeah. You can grow without credits. Right. Especially um, without Chinese credits. You, you can. You can. Exactly. OK, I'll rephrase that. There, there isn't a big business alive today <laughs> which hasn't got there without borrowing some sort of money at some point. Um, and I think that there isn't a country in the world which hasn't at some stage borrowed money um, in order to, to, to run its affairs. Um, but the old-fashioned bit of, of my approach is that I've, I've always taken the view that you have to live within your means. Um, we call it an old-fashioned thing because at the moment my country, Britain, um, seems to be disappearing under a sea of debt, um, whether it's government debt or individual debt, you know, money owed to credit card companies and, and, and so on. And, and somehow instinctively to me, that is a real problem. Because if you can't service that debt, then you are inevitably going to get into more trouble than the benefit you've got from whatever you did with the original loan in the first place. And while I'm not an economist, um, it, it seems to me that a lot, of, a lot of the debt that some countries are getting into, particularly with their relationship with, with Beijing, and particularly the projects and the, 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 that are paid for with those, with those debts, as well as the way those projects are run. For example, you know, I've, I've, I've driven past roadworks in this country where there are Chinese workers on them, and you think, this is, this is mad. You know, you're, you're borrowing money to pay for a new road, but that money is all going straight back into the Chinese economy, and none of it, or l very little of it, is sitting um, here in this country. So, so I, I, I think that there are many questions over that, um, and I think that there are real risks around it. Um, 
But you know, if, if governments are clever about it, they can, of course, exploit and provide. And then Chinese trucks are using this road. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so it's very, it's very perfect. Um, from Mr. Um, nice to meet you. And nice to see you. Uh, nice to see you there. Try really hard. Uh, my name is John uh, Jalal, my Kyrgyz name. And um, thanks for the amazing discussions. And my question is, what do you think uh, about uh, will you achieve the desired uh, result in the diplomatic relationship UK, uh, between the UK and the Kyrgyzstan? before the end of your mission there? Thank you. Thanks for the question, John. Um, it, it's actually a very difficult question to answer because, because you, 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 have to, you have to kind of set your objectives and then when you get to that point where you're supposed to object them, then assess yourself. Um, the way we do it in, 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 in the British Foreign Office, and I think it suits international policy, is that you have a kind of set of rolling objectives. You have some four-year strategic goals and you, you, you update those every year and you have some one-year, some 12-month goals and you reassess those every six months. So sometimes it's a bit like, you know, you, you set a goal, you run your way towards it and then, you know, as you get close it moves on away, you know, so you, you kind of never achieve it. So I, I think that the answer to your question is really, I mean, we'll have to have this conversation in three or four years time when I, when I get to the end of it. But, you know, at that point, I'll be able to look back, um, just as I did when I finished my assignment in, in Macedonia, and, and, and look at where we've come uh, across a range of different areas. So, so, you know, how is collaboration between the two countries now compared with what it was three or four years before? How much British business is being done here? How much British investment is, is, is there into, into Kyrgyzstan? How many Kyrgyz students are, are studying at British universities? Um, what is the state of, 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 of Kyrgyzstan's democracy? Um, how does its parliament run? What is its freedom of expression like? Has that got stronger over three or four years or has it followed a trend downwards? All of these things will, will, will provide me with an opportunity to assess whether I've um, understood that, or wh whether I've made a difference in, 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 the, in, in the course of my time here. Sorry, that's not a direct answer, but it, it, it's a very, it, 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 it's, a, it's a complex piece to, to get to. Good evening. Uh, thank you. First of all, uh, thank you, Your Excellency, for coming today for such an image and sharing with us your knowledge and experience. Uh, my name is Ajay. I'm a third year student. And recently, um, our university had finished completed a project that was uh, directed to promote democracy in our country. And to we... Sorry, to promote uh, pro uh, democracy. democracy. And we understood that our country is not so democratic as we thought. And now my question is, what is your um, suggestions how for us young generation to contribute to the development of democracy in our country? I think it's a really a big issue in our generation. Thank you. A, a, a great question. Did you say your name is Ajar? Ajar. Ajar. Great question, Ajar. I, I, I think um, there are at least two very powerful things that, that, that young people can do. In fact, that just about anyone can do, but typically young people have more energy and more desire and more passion and more ambition about these things. Than, than, than their older peers. Um, and those two things are, one, get active. You, you have the opportunity here to be active. You're allowed to have different political parties here. You're allowed to have different political opinions here. Express those opinions, form those parties, set up those parties, join them. Um, get active, not just in parliamentary democracy, but local democracy um, in terms of, um, of, of even just sort of democratic action within the workplace as well you know I mean get 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 things moving which allow people to to act in a democratic way at all levels that's the first thing be active the second thing I would say is demand more you're incredibly lucky in Kyrgyzstan in the context of Central Asia and many other countries around the world 
that you can express yourself here. One of the first things that happened after I got here was the, um, was the attempt to arrest um, Atambayev in Koytash on the 7th of, of August, and then the, the successful arrest on the 8th of August. And of course, that was a, a, a big political thing in Kyrgyzstan, which London was, of course, very interested in. And we reported it back to London. Um, and one of the things that they were most interested in London was our comment that this whole affair had been picked over and scrutinized in the media with a lot of criticism for the police, a lot of criticism for the interior ministry, a lot of criticism for the president himself over what was going on. And London were very impressed by that. And it really is a fantastic opportunity. So get out there and use that freedom of expression to demand more from government, to demand more from local authorities, to demand more from businesses, to, 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 to make comments about corruption. Make it clear that you won't stand for corruption because corruption is about taking money out of your pocket. So why should someone else have it? Make it clear that, you know, that, that rule of law is the best defense against that and is one of the foundation stones of democracy. Shout out for democracy and the, the direction the country has taken. Good evening, everybody. Mr. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep, keep these in mind, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone gets one if they ask a question. And then there are more, but different ones in there. I just want to comment on the first question that you asked. I came to ask, to, uh, ask that question, and thank you very much for raising it. The UN General Assembly has declared the next decade to be the decade of saving the ecosystems. Mm. As we can clearly see that the climate change is happening and it's time to sort of uh, unite against that. Uh, it's every country's problem, I would say. And I think part of your question was the alternative sources of the energy. And it's, uh, I would say, a big question in Kyrgyzstan as well. And we're thinking, when we're thinking about the alternative uh, energy sources, we can think about the windmills, the solar panels, etc., etc. But we, but we don't have the facilities to store this energy. Mm. That that presents another problem. So I think the way to tackle this problem is not only to address uh, or to create the new sources of the energy, is also to sort of try to stop the damage that is being done at the moment. And uh, my first question, which, which, which I came here tonight, was to ask if there is a fourth dimension, because you mentioned three dimensions of the work that the British uh, Embassy does, if there are any projects that you're doing in order to help the environment, in order to educate people, to, I don't know, not to invest, but create projects on the alternative energy sources to tackle this problem, this very problem. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, it, it's a great question. It's not, it's not exactly a fourth dimension, um, because the way we see it, um, climate change and all that climate change means affects those other things, especially security and prosperity, right? You know, I mean, the, it, it has a massive impact on both of those. And, um, and so we, we, we tend to address it in, 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 in the context of that. Um, and the answer is yes, we, 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 we do a lot out of the United Kingdom. Um, we, um, not only in the UK itself, where we were one of the first large developed countries to, to set a target of, um, of being, um, uh, of 2050 for being zero carbon um, emissions. Um, you know, some people would say that's a long way off, but I think one has to be quite realistic about, um, about how you get there. There's, a, there. there's huge pressure in the UK at the moment for that target to be brought forward to 2025. But that, of course, is only six years away. And, and, and in that time, you, know, you, you, you have to get rid of all the cars that are on the road. You have to change most of the power stations and so on. So I mean, that's unrealistic. But it is important that one sets those targets and sets a strategy for, for, for getting there. But we're also active around the world in this. And it, it's something which, um, which we're looking to get more active on in, in Central Asia because we recognize that you know, this is a region and, and Kyrgyzstan is a, as a country which is particularly impacted by that because of the glaciers and because of the, the countries and the region's dependence on those glaciers for a lot of what happens. If you don't address that now, if you don't find other ways 
of um, or, or replacing them when, the, when those glasses, when those resources have gone, then you know the, the threat to security goes right up, and the opportunities of prosperity go right down. Uh, my question was pretty much just to comment on that. If, if there are any projects that the British Embassy is working on to get with other organizations to help the uh, you mean you mean here in Kyrgyzstan, here in Kyrgyzstan. especially? Yes, we do actually. We, we've we've got um, through the Department for International Development. We, we've we've got a range of. They're not just Kyrgyz programs. They're they're regional and broader international programs to work, for example, with with farmers. And I, I know there's a detail which is happening in Kyrgyzstan to work with farmers to understand how their environment is going to change over the next five, ten, fifteen years. And what they need to do in terms of thinking about different crops or of providing for, for, for the water that their, 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 cro their current crops need so that they're prepared and so that you don't get that sort of sudden local shock which is caused by climate change, meaning that farmers can no longer produce the, the, the local economy's income. So we're doing that and we're looking to expand that a lot over the next two, three, four years. So I think, uh, uh, as I know, the embassy has no plastic policy inside the embassy. We right? do. Thank you for reminding me, Daniel. <laughs> yes. We, we, we had a, uh, a wonderful initiative back in July, which was called No Plastic is Fantastic. And we've, we, we've banned single-use plastic from the embassy. So if you, if you come to the embassy, you won't find plastic cups by the, the water cooler. You won't find plastic forks in the kitchen. Um, everything is, is, is reusable and, um, and, and, and plastic bags are a history now. We have just these, these, these ones made of natural materials, um, which, which I think is, is, is absolutely the, the, the way forward. It's a, it's, it's a small contribution, but it's, a, it's an important one because this is about changing the way we, we live our lives. Yeah. I think an example is very important. <laughs> you know, we, we hear a lot of words that are not supported with examples here in Kyrgyzstan. Right. So it's great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. <coughs> Thank you very much for a uh, great speech. Thank you, Daniel, for organizing it. Uh, if uh, I would like to answer some of your questions, uh, I would uh, answer to the first one, where will the Kyrgyzstan in 10 years? I'm looking forward to this. Um, I think after 10 years, uh, dear all, it will be time of our decisions and uh, we should uh, do our best for, uh, for uh, we should do our best today for having best and better future in 10 years. Therefore, I think uh, the activities of embassies uh, of United Kingdom, US Embassy and others it's very important to educate us in the right way and inform us about uh, right policies and etc. And as for my question, um, during your speech you have told that you are uh, helping to Turkish government to implementing the right policies based on data. Uh, how uh, US, uh, so sorry, how uh, UK embassy collecting data? Because uh, I'm from <laughs> research company, uh, I'm just interested in it. Do you have your own research department or something else? James Bond is doing it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. J James Bond does do most of it, actually. <laughs> um, so, so I, I, I'll make a comment and, and then I'll try and answer your question. Um, the, the, the comment is that I. I agree with your first point about the role of embassies here in Kyrgyzstan to a certain degree. But actually, of course, you know, we, we, can, we can collaborate and we can, we, we can set up programs to help strengthen democracy and so on. But actually, the amount that all of the embassies in this country, you know, including much bigger ones than, than my embassy, you know, the, the American embassy, the, the European Union delegation, everything that they can achieve put together is just a tiny fraction of what Kyrgyzstan needs to do. In, in other words, if Kyrgyzstan really wants to change, strengthen its democracy, strengthen its rule of law, fight corruption, develop its, its policy making formats in government and so on, it has to do it itself. It has, it, it has to find the way of, of doing it. 
It can't just sort of sit back. And it's, the same is true of every, of every country, actually. You know, the, the, the best change is organic change. It, com it comes from within. It might be guided from outside. The ideas might come from outside, but all the energy and the impetus really has to come from within. Um, and, um, and now I've lost track of the question. <laughs> Your data, yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, and it's not James Bond. Th thank you for the suggestion, Daniel. Um, we, we don't actually collect data. We, we, we don't do it. Um, what we do is that we, we work with um, organisations that promote the collection of, of, of good data. So, for example, um, we had a project with the World Bank which was run last week um, it's an ongoing annual event with the Aga Khan Foundation as well, called Life in Kyrgyzstan. Yep. And this is, I mean, you know about Life in Kyrgyzstan. It's a, it's a, it's a way of, of increasing the quality research that is done um, on Kyrgyzstan as a way of providing good data um, for use within the country, for, for making decisions and forming policies and so on. So that's one area. That's one way we do it. Um, again, we, we work um, it, with... with partners in government as well, especially in the Prime Minister's office, to, to support their efforts to find the data that is out there and to use that data in a way which really produces good policies. Because it, it's been shown time and again everywhere that policies which are based on, on solid data are better policies which are more likely to succeed. So we, we, the short answer is we, we, work, we work with people in order to provide it. We don't find it ourselves. My name is Siddharth and I'm from India. I'm living here in Bishkin. So uh, I'd like to continue from where you left off uh, in your second and third question regarding Russia and China. So all of us know that uh, Russia is re-emerging as a major international power, right? I mean, all of us are noticing the things that's going on in Syria now. Uh, America withdrawing and giving uh, Russia uh, the city and giving the food to them. And we all know about uh, the summit that has been going on in Sochi with the African leaders. Uh, I, I have always been fascinated, right? Uh, uh, this Central Asia has always been Russia's, uh, Russia's kind of territory, right? And now we are seeing uh, China moving in, in Central Asia. I mean, everyone can witness it, right? And. Uh, there is an interesting scenario that is being played on in the international geopolitical scene. Uh, right? Uh, uh, we have Russia and China, uh, both of them. We can't call them as ally of Donald Trump, right? And in Central Asia, how this thing is going to play out? Because uh, uh, Russia is surely not going to give up on Central Asia anytime soon. And China is, uh, all we know that the uh, one and road initiative, they are putting up too much of money in, in infrastructures. Uh, we know that they are also uh, gradually moving in in Central Asia. So how this is going to play on, uh, like uh, Central Asia? Uh, do you think uh, Russia's uh, soft power in Central Asia is waning? And uh, do you think uh, uh, China is growing in Central Asia? And uh, how do you see Russia holding up in Central Asia after maybe 25 years? Do you think their power will remain? Uh, and how Russia and China will play it out? It's a, it's a really hard question to answer that. I mean, the, the sort of, the, the way that most people look at the, the relative roles of Russia and China are that Russia, bring a kind of, Russia brings a kind of cultural and, um, and, and political influence, among other things, whereas China brings a much more economic influence, a commercial influence. And so, you know, for, for a long time, you can see these two things operating in parallel or above each other, alongside each other, however you will, they're not necessarily in, in conflict with each other. And um, so, so what a long time. Um, it becomes very difficult looking into the future um, to, to, to determine with certainty exactly how that's going to change. Because, you know, I mean, Chinese economic growth is not nearly as strong as it was a few years ago. Where is that going to go? Are they going to find their, their economic magic again? Um, or is it going to sort of continue sliding? We, we, we don't know the answer to that. Um, again, we, we, we don't know the answer about what's going to happen 
in, in Russia. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty about what's going to happen when Vladimir Putin eventually moves on. Um, I think it's also true that while you know, Russia's actions in, in Syria um, and with the African leaders in Sochi um, make for very good news, very positive news for, for Moscow, and in many ways it, it, it is genuinely positive. In some ways, actually, it, 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 it covers over a, a slightly more difficult truth, which is that the, the Russia as a country is, um, is, is not really producing the kind of internal reforms that are necessary and the economic growth that are necessary to continue to, to exert its influence into the future. At some stage, they will run into problems in, in, in one or both of those areas. So, so there's a lot of uncertainty around that too. But in the meantime, of course, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, I mean, Russia will be um, a very important player in Kyrgyzstan and the rest of Central Asia for a long time. And, and, and China will too, because even if their growth falls off a bit, they're still a massive producer and a, and, and a massive um, commercial influence. Good evening, my name is Natalia and I'm a reporter without borders, journalist, and I have a question which is totally connected to the previous question. Um, you mentioned in your presentation that uh, countries can influence other countries very much through culture, through uh, te technical um, achievements and through other many things. Uh, and you mentioned the emergence of Russia in our country and influence rise of China. And what the previous uh, speaker was uh, also mentioning. My question is about culture. Because one of the main instruments, not only technical achievements, but culture. And maybe you do, do not know, but China started bringing great operas and ballets to Kyrgyzstan, to our opera and ballet theater. And what impression it produced? You, I cannot just exp express my opinion because I was present at, the, uh, at this spectacle and it was awfully nice. <laughs> and Russian, Russia is more habitual for us. They, send very good artists, very good dancers, and we have very many performances seen by, uh, by us and produced by Russian artists. So, but what about Great Britain? What about United States of America? Very small influence in this area. Very small influence. While we know that in Great Britain, for instance, you have Royal Opera House. That's a nice uh, royal opera house with nice heritage of classical things. You have English national value. Why not bring them? Why not your embassy you know, should not be somehow involved in bringing them to us? Because through culture you can influence something which you cannot influence through other things. Thank you. I, I have a lot of sympathy with that. I, 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 there is, an, and clearly other people in the room do as well. I, um, I, I have seen some of the, um, the cultural offerings here. Um, quite recently, a, a, a performance um, of, of Yesenin at, at, at a theatre here. It was, it was one of the best pieces of theatre I've ever seen, actually. I mean, it was really fantastic. And, um, and another Russian play, which I saw at the weekend, at the, at, the, at the Russian Drama Theatre. So I, I've seen that and I've, I've, I've enjoyed it so much that I can assure you there is nothing I would like more than to be able to bring the Royal Opera House or one of the other touring opera companies to, to Bishkek um, or the National Ballet. It would, be, it would be a simply wonderful thing to do. The, the sad reality is though, of course, that you know, the, these companies are in huge demand, point one. They, they, they book up years in, in advance. And point two, they, they cost an enormous amount of money to, um, to, 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 to bring over. So one needs to, one needs to be quite realistic ab about what is possible. I, I would like, and this is going back to John's question about you know, sort of how you assess your, your, your success over the course of a posting, and one small part of it would be at some point 
to have in the four years to have some sort of major significant attractive successful cultural event of some sort and and, and I don't know what that will be yet but I, I, I really am determined to do something in, in, in that regard but I think it's also worth mentioning that besides the, the, the big pieces like the Royal Opera House and the National Ballet and so on there is an enormous amount of, of British soft power influence going on which is completely commercially based it, it, it doesn't need embassies or governments to get together to, to, to bring it about it's the it, it's the, the the pop music the rock music the music that's produced in in the UK which is very successful uh, and popular here as well as around the world it's in things like um, like like the film industry as well and the, the the enormous British influence over over successful international films but it's also through other um, very modern aspects of soft power like like the the, the, the English Premier League, which is, is one of the most watched football leagues in the world. Again, this, this kind of thing is, is, is spreading um, Britain's cultural influence um, very, very broadly. By the way, we had uh, the Globe Theatre five years ago. Yes, ago. yes, in, in the 450th anniversary year of yeah. Shakespeare's Birth or death, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was just because they visited every country in the world. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so it was, we were among the countries. Yeah. Good evening, Mr. Gar. Thanks for coming and thanks all for providing this event. Uh, as you mentioned before, uh, you say about, you know, first day of austerity, and you mentioned about that you help uh, UK MSA help uh, small business entrepreneurs here. Mm. So my question is, uh, could you give us some examples of uh, which companies uh, did you help and why did you choose them? And the uh, second one is, uh, what criteria should entrepreneurs meet in order to receive support from UK Chemists? Thanks. Right. It, it's, a, it's a good question. The, the answer is that we don't actually work directly with any businesses. Um, in, in Kyrgyzstan, except under certain circumstances. So, so British companies investing in Kyrgyzstan, of course we work directly with them. Um, Kyrgyz companies which want to e export something to, to the UK or to buy something from the UK, we will work with them as well to, to, to make that work properly. But, but what you're talking about, I think, is about providing support to Kyrgyz companies to, to develop. Exactly. And in that, we don't work directly with, with small businesses. What we do is we work to improve the environment in which those businesses can, can set up and can develop themselves and, and, and grow and create more, um, more, more jobs. Um, and, and the way we do that is, is, for example, through these business incubators. I mentioned a project earlier this evening which is going to see business incubators set up first in Bishkek and then in Osh and then around the country. And th those will be spaces um, where small businesses and entrepreneurs can come and get advice that they need to develop to help um, make decisions, where they can exchange um, ideas and, and form alliances and collaborations and so on with others, and generally to, 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 to provide them with the support they need to grow. But we're also working you know, with, with government in areas like the rule of law. And this is, this is a really important area. Of course, it's very general, but it's very important for business. If you don't have rule of law that is certain, that you can rely on, then it's very difficult for businesses, whether they're small or large, to, to, to operate with the certainty they need to make planning decisions, for example, and, 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 and therefore to grow. So, so the rule of law is very important. I, I speak to a lot of British businesses about um, investing in, in Kyrgyzstan and, and the one thing they always mention is, is rule of law. They want to know what the state of rule of law is because for businesses it's, it, it really is the single most important factor. And maybe you can also talk about Creative Central Asia and Creative Spark. Yes, ab absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, so, so Creative Central Asia is a, 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 an initiative started by the, the British Council uh, under which they, they, they work with countries in Central Asia um, to bring people together from, from all aspects of the creative sector um, in order to exchange ideas and, and again to, to
to, to build collaborations and, and, and provide uh, a more productive and creative environment for, for, for small businesses in the creative sector to grow. And I'm very excited about that because I, um, the, the creative sector, I think, is, is particularly that are, that, 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 that are um, operating and thriving in this environment as, as a good example of it. But another aspect, which is really important for Kyrgyzstan, is that so much of the creative sector is, doesn't have to be in a big city. You know, it, it, it doesn't have to be in Bishkek. You, you can be in a, in a, in a remote town, you know, not even in Narin, but a village beyond Narin, somewhere up in the mountains. And you, know, you can carry on a creative sector business from that place if you have the right connections and the right communications. It's a very portable, very portable um, sector, and therefore, I think, of particular potential for Kyrgyzstan. Uh, good evening, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, my name is Marina. I'm very happy to hear your lecture and know your broad knowledge about Central Asia politics and economics. But I have another question um, related to the conflict in Ukraine. Uh, is, uh, this time it seems to be a frozen conflict, which means that nothing really going on and both parties are rather settled. But how do you think it will be happening in the future? Do you think it may influence uh, uh, the relations between Russia and the uh, European Union, UK? What do you think of the future and uh, how it will influence Ukraine itself? Yeah, re really interesting question. And if, if you've got an hour and a half, I'll try and answer it. But, um, but, but more seriously, um, I, I, actually, I, I spent some, some time, a, a month and a half, in, in Kiev before I came here. They, the, the Foreign Office sent me there to, to learn Russian. And, um, and I, I loved Kiev. I, I loved Ukraine. It, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful country, a beautiful city, with, um, with a, lot of, a lot of what I subsequently understood was actually Ukrainian culture, which before I'd thought of as Russian culture. And so it's either, you know, it, it, it really charmed me, my time in, my time in Kiev. Um, and at the same time, it made me feel very sad and frustrated about what was happening in that country. And I very quickly learned not to describe it actually as a frozen conflict, um, because as many Ukrainians were very quick to point out, it's not frozen, it's active, and people are dying, um, you know, on a, on a regular basis in, in, in Donbass and, and, and elsewhere. Um, it, it of course has a major influence on the relationship between between Europe and and, and, and Russia, um, and, um, and and I regret that enormously because um, it is absolutely clear to me that if the countries of Europe and Russia can cooperate <coughs> together, can collaborate together, we can achieve so much more together than if we're you know, closing the door in each other's face and imposing sanctions and um, supporting um, military activity in, in, in other countries and, of course, occupying uh, the Crimea. You know, th those sort of actions are, are intensely uh, aggressive um, and, um, and, and a real challenge for, for the countries of Europe, which believe very deeply in um, sovereign integrity, that countries should not be invaded um, in, in the way that, that the Crimea was invaded. Um, that, you know, that, that, that conflicts like the one in Donbass should be brought to a close as quickly as possible and as collaboratively as possible, and that's not happening. Um, so so I, I, I'm not enormously optimistic about, about Ukraine. I, I, I can't see the situation changing very fast, very soon. Um, and until it does, it, it's going to be a real problem for that relationship between European countries and Russia. On the other hand, I, I think that, um, that the situation has moved faster since the election of Zelensky's government um, than it has done for some time before that. And, and, and that perhaps offers some hope for, for the future. And, um, and, and, and the other point is that, you know, the, these things do change. I, I mentioned earlier that, that you know, that, that Putin will move on. There will be change in Russia at some point. Um, and, um, and, and who knows, perhaps that'll throw up the opportunity that allows us to, to, to take a more constructive approach to, to what's going on for the, for the benefit of everyone. Good evening, everyone. 
my name is Menin. Uh, thank you for coming here. And for your speech was pretty informative. Thank you for that. I'm a biologist, so I'm personally very happy that you put the climate-related questions as the first one in your study questions list because it really worries me a lot. So my uh, answer is going to be more like in the comments slash advice form. Uh, well, to start with, I'm thinking that we're super happy. I mean, we're very lucky that we are living in a country like Kyrgyzstan because the geological location is ideal, almost perfect. Uh, our country is mountainous, so it means that as the height keeps increasing, that the more ecosystems we have, so it's a variety of the ecosystems we have. And there's so many animals and plants that we have which are uh, getting extinct, but we still have them. And the problem is that uh, while our country is developing yet, so we have so many issues related to the political questions, economical questions, cultural related questions. But right now, everybody is neglecting the ecology related issues. And that's the main problem. Because right now, even becoming eco-friendly is more like the mainstream. But people don't really take this question consciously. So they don't relate themselves to the ecology they're living in. Everybody is caring about the business. So uh, when you were saying that you were helping people mostly uh, like developing their business structures. But the problem is, if you're going to destroy the place we're living in, the bio biome that we're living in, there's going to be no place for developing business. Um, I guess uh, the problem, the main issue in our country is that we don't recycle. So we are using the resources unsustainably. Uh, and my advice for you would be, um, you already told to my colleague uh, that you are now um, are working in the projects with the farmers. So you're helping them to gently move on the different products to face the ecological catastrophes in the case that they would be. Uh, to face them like move gently over them. Uh, but I guess it would be a better decision to have, for example, more like the training courses or the educational, um, something related to education. For example, you may invite the ecologists from your country because they are more skilled in these questions, they have more experience, and they may come here and train the young activists because I have seen many people who start caring about these questions, but they don't really know how to start fighting it. So what should they do? Just collect the trash? Or maybe raise the questions on the governmental level? Because you are now uh, representing the embassy, you have more state-related relationship with our state. I mean, the head of our states, so it means that uh, when you are going to be expressing your opinion, probably they are going to listen to you more than they are like, because us, they are neglecting us. We are young, we are not experienced, they have more really, um, really hard questions to face, like, that they have to tackle it. Uh, so that's my advice. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for that. I, and I, I, I agree with so much of it. Um, I, you know, feel um, intensely frustrated when I go to an incredibly beautiful place like Ala Archa, for example. I mean, you know, I mean, as beautiful as anything in the world. And of course, a lot of people feel the same way because a lot of people go there. But many of those people who go there and think, gosh, this is a lovely place, leave rubbish behind, making it a less lovely place. And you think, I mean, what's going through their head? You know, wh why do you want to make something which is beautiful, so beautiful that it attracts you to drive out there and see it, and then leave it less beautiful than when you arrived? I, I find that very difficult to, to understand. Um, but, but I think you're, you're absolutely right in that. It's, it, it's about education. It's about people understanding and changing their daily routine to, you know, to ensure that you know, they take litter home with them and that when they take it home, they sort it out into plastic and cardboard and glass and tin and, and make sure that it goes to the right recycling thing. But of course, there is the other angle, which is that there has to be the framework for recycling to happen. So someone has to set up a recycling facility. Usually, that's thankfully, that, that can be a commercial venture. So someone can collect tins and recycle the metal. Someone can collect glass and recycle the glass. But it, it takes, takes time and effort and coordination to do it. And I, I mean, I, I don't have the answer to that now, but I would support it very strongly if it happened. Yeah, hello, my name is Bakrit. <coughs> and I'm so glad that you're here today. And we have so good uh, questions. And just uh, when you ask questions, I wanted to, I, I thought to answer you these three last questions you gave. I also have questions myself. Um, um, you know, like a, a lot of these three questions are very much connected. 
especially the, the third one to both two, uh, to, and, uh, to the previous two. And uh, uh, you know, this uh, the influence of Russia here actually decreasing, I think. Because, you know, what's our future of Kyrgyzstan? This is our youth, right? <laughs> We have to think, if to think about what our young people are thinking now and the way they taught, learned history. They don't feel a bit like uh, away from Russia. Like they more they want to, you know, learn from West, from the West. And uh, I think that uh, Russia, I think, uh, of course, it has very strong cultural. We speak in Russia, you know, uh, connection with us. But actually, uh, because because of the young people now. Uh, more think about the West and more close to the Western viewpoints, uh, like in, I think in the major the, the major part of, of the youth. I think the future will be. I think Russia will have less influence in the future, and uh, if unless it changes something and its policy, etc. And uh, of course about China, actually, it's a really I think real danger for us because it's really now economically coming to us. You know, a lot of a lot of our ladies, you know. Uh, getting married to Chinese people, and they're, they're actually inviting them to, to marry because a lot of male in China and less females. Yeah, that's right. You know, I have some uh, curious uh, girls who are ladies who are working in these uh, Chinese uh, some kind of companies. They were actively inviting them and promising a lot of things, wealth, etc. So I think that China will get real influence. I think it, it will have a lot of uh, like labor, labor, like pe people, like workers coming here. Labor power here, and uh, and I think uh, I think naturally the American is. I think in future we can become like part of China, or we become like. And also a lot of young people are learning intensively Chinese language, so I think the role of China will be increasing. So like in ten years, well, you know, about my question actually is connected with the, with the last your question because you know our young people are like uh, like in ten years, in ten years. About like the last question was about if uh, what our future of Kyrgyzstan yeah. ten years. But you know, uh, my question is like we have the freedom, the like well, the most democratic countries perhaps in CIS countries I don't know or in Central Asia for sure. But actually now yeah, our young people want to leave the country. You know, a lot of adults thinking that uh, there is no future in Kyrgyzstan. Like oh, I I agree that you just leave even if you marry somewhere abroad. I'm agree because nothing is changing. Mm -hmm. People, people are very much frustrated. Do you really think that democracy, that, it's, we, that we have this freedom, maybe we didn't use it in the right way, but this freedom that does give us really, uh, you know, helps us. Because, for example, Kazakh people who are more, have, have some kind of authoritarian regime, they just not live in the country too much. They young people not live in the country too much. But our people want to leave the country. And, uh, uh, like in also with one year in Singapore, at the beginning he was a bit like like it was democracy with some kind of dictatorship, right? So do you think maybe we I don't know I don't want to catch here, but I, maybe we had to use you know our democracy in a better way. So that's why I, I hope just that our young people really will take power in the future. Then we can have changes. Thank you. Yeah. No, I, I think so. That's really really interesting comments actually. Um, and I mean, it, it, it put me in mind of what the, the Indian gentleman was saying earlier, that um, about the influence, the relative influence of China and Russia. And of course, a very powerful thing which I didn't mention earlier is that money talks, right? You know, if, if, you, bring, if you bring money to the party, then a lot of people will pay you attention. If you bring just, you know, just, just nice words or or historical connections, then, then people might not be so interested. So I, I, I think that, that China's, China's influence will, will probably grow if they, if they continue to grow their economic um, influence here. Um, but um, but I, I, I was also interested in, in what you were saying about you know, sort of the, the, the desires of young people. And, um, and, and I, I think you're, you're absolutely right. You know, I mean, of course, a huge number of people go to Russia. There are some 800,000 Kyrgyz people in Russia, and that itself is a very powerful influencer on, on, on what happens in Kyrgyzstan. Um, and as you mentioned, as you illustrated, there's the, the Chinese influence. But of course, what's new in the last 30 years, um, maybe even the last 20, 25 years, is the number of people in Kyrgyzstan, especially young people, who have got in, who, who, have, who have got an education from, from from Europe or from North America or from somewhere else other than Russia and, or, or China, and and that that brings its own influence. That that brings 
a hunger for the way that, that, that things can be done in terms of, of, of rule of law and democracy. And that will also have, have, have an influence as well, I suspect, as the younger people become more influential in society. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Aitar. I'm an international relations student. And uh, unfortunately, nowadays, many countries are going through uh, terrible events connected with ethnic clashes and uh, separatist movements. Mm. And uh, for instance, the case of Hong Kong and Xinjiang in China, or the situation in northern Syria, or the Irish people in Great Britain, or Catalonia in Spain, or for example, in our country, the, the situation, the case uh, in 2010, ethnic clash uh, between ethnic uh, groups in the southern part of our country. And um, the Paul uh, says uh, prevention is better than cure. And my question is, uh, how, uh, uh, how do you think, uh, which steps do the governments, the states, uh, make in order to prevent uh, such uh, terrible events? Mm. Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, another great question. I, I'm really enjoying these questions, by the way. They're all really good. Um, I have to say that I, I think it can have a very, the, 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 the reaction that a government makes towards pressure for independence or, or autonomy or, or, or separation um, can have a, can play a very very important role in this. Um, I, I, I don't follow Spanish politics very closely, but but from what I see in Catalonia, they, they've got a real challenge on their hands there. Partly, it's been stimulated by a very hard line from 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 Madrid. Um, but as I say, I, I don't follow that very closely, and and in fact, you know. It's clear that all, all situations are very different. I mean, the case of Scotland, for example, there was a lot of support for independence. And there was a lot of support for more autonomy from London. And, and London provided a lot of that. And then, of course, provided a referendum, which, um, which gave a fairly clear result, actually. The, 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 the majority of Scots, it was 56 to, to 44, um, wanted to stay part of the United Kingdom. And, and, and that, of course, is a very... Um, um, it's very welcome for someone who, like me who believes in, in, in the unity of the United Kingdom. But of course I wouldn't go so far as to say that the Scots should never be allowed to become independent because I think that that is, that, that is um, something which is probably likely to increase support for independence and ultimately increase the challenges around it and, and, and the difficulties that we would face with it. So, so I think that the, the referendum approach was the right one um, but of course, it, it's been thrown into greater uncertainty recently by, by the Brexit question, um, as, as those supporters of independence aim to base a, a renewed claim for, for an independence referendum on the fact that the United Kingdom is leaving the European Union. So, so there are no magic buttons to push on any of these things, but I do instinctively feel that the, the, the more democratic, the more flexible approach is probably the right one, even if you want to keep um, the, the unity of a country. And I, I would say just a word on Hong Kong about this. When, when I was living and working there, there was the, the big argument in, in the negotiations was about the level of democracy that Hong Kong should enjoy after it became part of China again. And, um, and there was a very strong argument from the, the last governor of Hong Kong, Chris Patton, who said that, um, who said that it, was the, it was Great Britain's responsibility to maximize the level of democracy in, in Hong Kong before 1997. And there was a very powerful body of opinion which said, no, you have to do what China wants because you, you, you need to have uh, stability and certainty. And, and anyway, and this was the bit which, which, which I, I reflect on now, anyway, Chinese people don't do democracy. They, 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 they don't like it. It's not, it's not part of their society. It's not suited to the way they live. And, and then it was very difficult to argue against that because there, there was no example of a Chinese society which really had gone down the democratic route. Um, but, but somehow it felt instinctively wrong that the, the democracy is, is supported in, in, in Europe and North America and other places because that's what human beings ultimately want. Um, as the framework for their society. Why should that be different for human beings in China? 
but it was very difficult to argue against it. But then, of course, through the 90s and, and the early noughties, the early part of this century, um, we had the example of, of Taiwan, which made a very successful transition from, from a dictatorship under Chiang Kai-shek to, uh, to a very fair, very democratic <coughs> society based on the rule of law, uh, which has a tolerant and open society, and, and which, of course, is utterly Chinese. It, 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 it disproves this idea that, that, that Chinese people don't do democracy. And, and I think that that is where um, a lot of the problem is happening in, in Hong Kong. I think Beijing really does not want to go any further than, than what was agreed under the transfer of sovereignty. In fact, they want to sort of push that back a bit um, because they're, more, they're, they're instinctively more comfortable with that. And, and, and I think that is, is increasing the, the, the pressure within Hong Kong because human beings won't be denied. Once, once they have a taste of that, they, they, they want democracy because they know that it's the, most, it's the fairest way to run a society. Hello, sir. I have a comment on the, uh, the question that you make that uh, how, uh, how is the future of Pakistan going to be? Mm -hmm. So I genuinely feel that it's going to become a very big tourist destination like Malta and Europe. So for that to happen, like the companies and various startup needs to make the place more accessible, more better, and also the movement needs to check the level of crimes that is happening. And yeah. For the uh, image of Pakistan to be better because I've seen a lot of tourists coming from Europe and North America and that is like they like the place very much. And also I have a question. Uh, one of the clubs from England, the Liverpool FC, won the uh, Champions League this year and they had one player called Mohamed Salah. Yeah. So yeah, the level of crimes against Muslims that is racially motivated against Muslims drastically decreased in Liverpool which has known to be a place which was very hostile against Muslims. Do you think like a medium like sports can be a way to promote uh, unity among the people? Do you think it's a genuine way? Because we have seen the Liverpool model where the level of acceptance has very much increased. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that's really interesting. Um, I think that, that in, in Britain we have a, ve a very diverse society these days. Um, in London alone, which of course is, is known for being a, a world city, um, at, at London's primary schools there are 300, 320 different mother tongues spoken. Of course they all learn in English, but you know when they go home to their parents they're, they're speaking one of 320 different mother tongues. That shows how much diversity there is in London. And I'm very glad to say that, that you know, the, the racism and the, the, the anti-immigrant um, sentiment that you often saw in, 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 in London maybe 30 years ago, maybe a bit more, maybe 40 years ago when I was a student there, um, really is pretty much a thing of the past. Of course you get, you, you get conflict between different groups of people in London, but it's, it's not based on the same sort of hatred of outsiders as, as, as it used to be. And I think that that is largely down to Londoners le learning to grow as a diverse community, and I think that's very important. But unfortunately, the, the situation is not just black and white, um, to use perhaps an unfortunate term. It's, it's more complex than that. And I, I mean, I noticed, for example, in, um, at a football match in, in Bulgaria recently, when England played Bulgaria in a qualifying game for the, um, for, for the European Championships, um, there, there was racist abuse of, of the black players on, on the England side and, and racist abuse which was not just, you know, sort of awful hate-filled stuff, you know, sort of monkey noises to, to, to African players and so on. But it was, you know, accompanied by Nazi salutes, you know, I mean, it's, it, it's a sort of deeply, um, deeply historic and, 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 and primitive way of, of, of approaching things and unfortunately, you know, the, 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 the increased diversity that you get sometimes stimulates those sort of reactions as well. But I, I like her example of, of Liverpool and Mohamed Salah. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. uh, my question. <laughs> so, good day, Mr. Garrett. Uh, my name is Michael. Happy to see you here. Thank you very much for coming. So, um, I have, uh, first of all, the answer to your question. Uh, this is very popular. 
so everybody answer or answering this question like what what Kyrgyzstan is going to be in ten years. So uh, I think uh, Kyrgyzstan is located in the heart of Central Asia. So that's why it's affected by different countries. That's why Russia is sometimes just having some interests and uh, helping sometimes, yeah, and China and uh, the foreign countries just as well. So I think um, our people uh, are fond of just uh, getting some new knowledge and that's why they are traveling abroad. And I think that um, in 10 years, I think that uh, people there are seeing that um, uh, the world is open to them, and they are bringing the new uh, knowledge from uh, another another country, just traveling to some other countries. Uh, and I think that our country will be uh, just will come up with an idea to uh, bring them all back. Uh, and uh, they are currently working on it, as I see. So, um, and I think uh, that people will will come back, and uh, our uh, like I'm working with UN, and uh, they are. I see how uh, powerful they are, so they're uh, really uh, taking the experience from other countries uh, and they're bringing them here. Um, and uh, there's one more thing that I wanted to say about the future, that's uh, uh, the democracy and the, fem the feminism and uh, egalitarianism. So I think, it, I know it's the trend in the, in the uh, developed countries, and I think that Pakistan has the roots, uh, very deep roots for uh, just placing uh, this new uh, idea in our minds because uh, like I think this this is going to be a feature a featuring a point for the Kyrgyzstan in the future so um, and I think that um, uh, in, in future we will uh, succeed to uh, achieve our goals and um, and I have a few questions so uh, they are connected with my answer. Uh, the first is the uh, uh, internships uh, and like opportunities for the people. Yeah. So as I said, it is important to exchange the experience. Uh, I work for the company, like the construction company here, and I saw how it has helped the company to bring uh, an international expert. So uh, are there any? So my first question uh, is. Uh, about the uh, exchange experience, like, are you going to like, are there any projects, any like plans of the UK government to, ch to send the specialists here to Kyrgyzstan, and and uh, vice versa to bring the people to the UK, like, if they are skilled, do they have uh, necessary skills for the UK, and they can bring in something new, so uh, and maybe the internship opportunities, employment opportunities, etc. Um, the second question is about the uh, uh, the reason. Uh, with, what do you think about it? That whether it will be popular, like, and when will Pakistan come to it? So, and the the third question, the last question, about the climate change. Uh, as I know, uh, as we know, it affects entire the entire world. And what uh, do you think about it in UK, your native country? Uh, how is it going to be affected? Uh, how your uh, fighting with it, and uh, maybe you, the Europe itself in general. Like, what countries are the most affected? Going to be the most affected by this? Thank you. Sorry, what was the middle question? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the middle question was about the uh, Israel tourism. The first was about uh, the opportunities for the exchange, the skills, etc., the like yeah. internships, and the third about the change in, in Europe, in UK. Okay, I, I, I'll just make a very quick comment on, on, on what you say about bringing talent into the country. Barkin's comment, I think, is, is, is very, which I didn't comment on, which, which is very relevant in this. It's a huge challenge for, um, for all developing countries to hold on to their talent. And one of the sort of the, the, the big injustices, I think, of, of, of the way the modern world is set up is that very often um, developing countries put money and resources into, into, into building their talent. And that talent is then taken to feed the economy of developed countries. And it, it, it's, it, it's something I don't think one could do very much about, but it is nonetheless an injustice. And it causes a brain drain, which I think is always going to be a challenge for a country like Kyrgyzstan. Um, of course, you, you set out the holy grail, which is that when people go overseas and they learn new things and they make new contacts, you want them then to come back to Kyrgyzstan to benefit the local economy. And, 
So anything you can do to help that um, happen is, is going to help bring about your optimistic view of the future of this country. Um, now I've got all three questions. Egalitarianism. Egalitarianism. Right. Well, I mean, you know, that's that, that's something which, to my mind, is 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 really down to, to society. It's about it's about. I mean, going back to one of the very first questions about what young people can do. You know, like rule of law. Don't let people live outside the law. It's it, it, it's not fair on on people who work hard to, to pay their taxes that um, that other people should not work but take take money from them. Corruption is a really bad thing. Demand that sort of thing, and you'll be helping to promote egalitarianism. And the third one was about climate change and climate change how it will UK. affect in Europe. So, so I mean, you know, the, the effect on the UK is is perhaps less dramatic here. We don't have any glaciers which are melting. But our biodiversity is changing. But you're, you're an island. And very good. We're, we're an island, yes. We're an it's island. A risk. And, and certainly, you know, sea levels are rising. But fortunately, we, we have quite big cliffs around our island. Um, but but it, is, it is impacting um, the UK quite considerably. The temperatures are rising. Um, you know, in some, in some cases, it's a good thing. So, for example, in Kent, which is the part of England closest to, to, to France, the, the climate there has become very light the climate that um, has produced champagne in France for hundreds of years. So suddenly, in Kent, in the United Kingdom, they're producing absolutely fantastic sparkling white wine. Now, that's great for the local economy. But on the other hand, we're seeing much more frequent damaging meteorological uh, events happening. We get many more storms, much more heavy rainfall than we used to have, stronger winds. And this, um, if, if, you, if you follow what most meteorologists believe, is a direct result of climate change. So, so there, there's definite downside too. Thank you. And the last two questions, and then I'll ask some blitz questions too. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, please. Well, I have exactly the two questions. And the first is. Um, <laughs> 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 first one, you only get one present, right? <laughs> very short. Um, the first one is: What is the UK geopolitical interest in Central Asia? Oh. The recent wars, and the second, as I know. Um, the Central Asia is like a, a great um, plate for great powers policy, and um, I want you to be more specific and less positive about it. And so, what are what are the risks and main threats to the countries externally to Central Asia? Yeah, this is my two questions. Okay, don't be positive. <laughs> <laughs> This is such a miserable place to live. <laughs> it, it, it's really terrible. The challenges are enormous, and I really can't see any solution to them. Well, thank you. Now we believe you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we wanted to hear. <laughs> I mean, but more seriously, I mean, a, a lot of a lot of the challenges have come up in the conversation um, this evening. I mean, they, you, you've got significant challenges if you want to strengthen democracy. You've got significant challenges about strengthening freedom of expression. You've got significant challenges about the rule of law. You know, I mean, if, if, I, was, if I wanted to pursue a lawsuit um, through a, a, a court in, in this country, and in any of the countries of Central Asia, I would not be at all certain that it would receive an objective examination and, and, and receive a, a fair response in, in, in line with the law. That might happen, but I wouldn't have the certainty that I would, for example, in Germany or Switzerland or Britain or, or, or many other countries. And that's a huge challenge. Um, I think the brain drain that, that has been mentioned a few times, that, that, that is a, a, a real threat to this country. I think some of, the, um, some of the economic factors around this country, for example, um, your economy's dependence, your GDP's dependence, um, on remittances from, from, from Kyrgyz working in, in, in Russia is a huge challenge for you. It's 40% of GDP, 35-40% of GDP. If the Russian economy goes down, you have a major problem here in Kyrgyzstan. 10% of your GDP comes from one gold mine, Kumtor. Again, that's going to close in, in, in two, three, four, five years' time, quite soon. Again, you, where are you going to replace that 10% of GDP from? The, these are, are major structural economic challenges. Um, you have other emerging challenges, which may or may not be challenges, but you know, it's things that, that, that need to be factored in around the change of society, um, questions which are very real and very imminent around the return of, 
of the family members of foreign fighters from Syria. It's a, it, it, it's a major challenge um, on, on the security front. Um, collaboration with your neighbors. I mean, you know, in, in, in trying to, to secure your country, the, the first priority has to be your immediate neighbors. So it's, it, it, it's clear why you have the relationship you do with China. It's clear why you have the relationship you do with Russia. Um, but it, it's, it, it's mad not to have a collaborative, positive relationship with, with Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Kazakhstan as well. The, these are countries which, with better collaboration and, and, and more positive cooperation, could, could really improve the, the, the position of not just this country, but the whole of the region. So, so I, I hope I've been ne you know, negative enough for you now. <laughs> I, you know, th these, are, these are all significant challenges. And, um, and, and, and not necessarily with, with, with quick solutions to them. But um, at least if, if, if you use the freedom of expression you've got to exchange ideas about how to approach them, then you do at least have you know, the beginnings of, of a conversation which could help find a way forward. Okay. Uh, but you didn't answer for the first question. What is the UK geopolitical interest in South Asia, if there is? Right, so, so that goes back to um, a lot of what I was saying earlier. Around, around security and, and the way that security operates, security questions operate in the world today. Um, you know, no, no country is an island. You, you, you cannot expect to be able to answer all your security questions just in the context of your own country, which is why we need, as, as the United Kingdom, we need to collaborate with, with countries all around the world, including Kyrgyzstan, because instability in Kyrgyzstan is, um, is, is never going to be kept just within the borders of Kyrgyzstan. It will move outside and could impact the United Kingdom negatively. So that's part of our strategic interest. Um, organized crime is another one. I mean, we have, we, we have um, people from the British National Crime Agency who are based in the region who cooperate with um, the agencies in, 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 in Central Asian countries. They, they follow the drugs routes, the gun routes, the people smuggling routes which come up through, through, through many different countries before reaching the United Kingdom. We, in the United Kingdom, people buy drugs and use drugs which have come through Kyrgyzstan. Um, I'm not sure about, about weapons, um, but there are certainly people who have, have, um, have, have you know, come on um, people smuggling routes, which, which might not involve Kyrgyzstan, but certainly involve other parts of, of Central Asia. So, th so these questions and many others form part of our geostrategic interest here and are a, and a very important part of why, of why we have an embassy in order to build that collaboration to, to, to share. I mean, in, in a way, it's, it's wrong to talk about Britain's geostrategic interests here because these are shared interests. You know, the, these are British and Kyrgyz interests. They're British and Kazakh, British and Russian, British and Chinese. And it's all about finding ways to, to, to collaborate in order to respond to those wider shared geostrategic interests okay thank you uh so now i have uh, we covered almost all questions that i wanted to cover but i also have some very brief questions we have 10 minutes uh so maybe one answer for uh, one one minute for every answer uh but these are the questions that i really wanted to know your opinion about some of them are very serious some of them are not uh but let's try if you don't mind. So first, uh, you came to Kyrgyzstan. What was the choice between what countries? And uh, why Kyrgyzstan? The choice was, if I remember right, uh, between Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Armenia. OK, I understand. Now, <laughs> <laughs> um, each of those has its attractive features, and each of them has its, its, its challenges. Um, I, was, I was particularly interested. Actually, I mean, I was looking at those three because, because Russian language, which I studied at university, which I had not used properly in my career, it was possible to use in each of those three countries. And that, 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 that was a, a particular attraction. Um, but, but I was also attracted to those three because they're in an area which is not Europe and not East Asia, and those, so, so something completely different for me. Um, and I was particularly attracted by Kyrgyzstan, I think, for the, for the single reason that the, the, the state of development of the country 
in terms of especially um, democracy and rule of law, but also more broadly society, was such that you know, Britain has something really to offer to collaboration. Mm. We have a long history of democracy in Britain, okay. a long history of rule of law, and I wanted to be able to bring that here. Sorry, that was a minute and 20 seconds. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, second, so when, uh, when you come here and you look at us, you obviously you have different angle. When we go to Europe, for example, any, on it, any developed countries, we get asked about what makes Kyrgyzstan unique, and we try to speak about nature, all that. Many countries in the world are beautiful. Uh, every country believes that its nature is unique. So what should, what should we say to European people, for example, uh, when we speak about Kyrgyzstan? That would be really convincing, a deal breaker, that would make them interested in our country, but still it would be truth. Okay, I'll, I'll mention two things which are, which are totally truthful and which will um, get a positive response from um, different audiences. One is, again, uh, democracy and rule of law. You, you have a unique status in Central Asia on that front and freedom of expression. Um, so, you know, major on that because that is something of interest to all Europeans in the context of Central Asia. The second thing is your nomad, nomadic culture. Mm. I was really struck when I was preparing for my posting here during the World Nomad Games last year that that got news time on the BBC TV in the evening. It had a photograph which covered the front page of the Financial Times in the UK. And because people suddenly said, wow, what's that? So major on that too. Okay. So third one, why Arsenal Football Club? And what do you think about the rumors of Mourinho replacing Henry? <laughs> Uh, that's not going to happen. <laughs> we all hope, but... No, that, that is not going to happen, that last bit. Um, why Arsenal, though? Um, I, was, I was seven years old in 1971, and the FA Cup final was coming up, and it was between mm. Arsenal and Liverpool. And, um, and everyone in the school seemed to be supporting either Arsenal or Liverpool, and I didn't support anyone. <laughs> Um, and, um, and so I thought about it, and I thought, well, my dad is a Londoner. Although he supports Crystal Palace, mm. Arsenal is a London side. So I'll support Arsenal, because I don't even know where Liverpool is. So I supported Arsenal. We went 1-0 down, and then we won the match 2-1. Mm. And I was sold for life. Yeah, okay. So very symbolic that tonight Liverpool and Arsenal are playing again. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, so the next one is more serious. Uh, so I'll not ask about why Brexit and all that, but... Uh, I want to really know your opinion. Uh, you said that migration is huge, and uh, you thought that with the with the with the poverty decreasing in the world, you expected that migration would be less. However, we see that migration is growing; it's becoming a big problem. Don't you think that the reason for migration is uh, is the differences? It's not the level of poverty in our countries, but it's the level of differences between the uh, developing countries and the developed world, and the and close to this question, uh, you said yes. In 1987, it was it seemed that the world would be boring, no problems. However, now we see that countries are building new walls. The American uh, the American president is building a concrete wall in the 21st century. Uh, now, uh, Great Britain is leaving Europe. And uh, don't you think that in the climate change, the problem, the technological shift that we are facing now, that will make poor countries poorer, uh, rich countries richer, don't you think that it's, uh, that it's very bad that we're closing the gates and that we're building more borders, more walls, and that no country in the end will win from that? It's a really complex question. I, I think in, in, terms of, in terms of what drives migration, I think you're right, it is partly the, 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 the gap in income levels between, between countries. I think there are also pull factors as well, though, as well as, as, well as push factors. For example, in, in developed countries like the UK, we've become addicted to, um, to, to certain cheap products, mm -hmm. which can only be produced by cheap labor. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, you know, a lot of the, the agricultural produce in the UK is now picked by immigrant labor. And that is a, a demand-led thing. We, we, we want that. I, I agree with you about walls. I, I, I think that you know, that is not the answer to migration. It's been shown time and again 
that you know migrants and, and their smuggling rings have ways around them. If you build a big wall, the, the, the smugglers will simply charge bigger fees to get through. So all you're doing is feeding organised crime. Yeah. But you do have to find a way of, of, of regulating it because society demands that. Okay. Um, you're the most active ambassador in social media. I mean, among all the ambassadors that we've seen in Kyrgyzstan not only from Britain, but from all other countries. Is it a policy or is it your personal position? It's a bit of both. The, um, I, the, the Foreign Office, about um, five or ten years ago, took a decision that social media um, was a really central, important part of, of diplomacy in the modern world. When I started the Foreign Office, you, you, you developed relationships with with newspapers, with journalists, with editors and TV stations in order to have opportunities mm -hmm. to get your messages out. Now you don't need to do that. Of course you do it because it's interesting and it's helpful. But if you want to communicate with a country that you're working in, you can do it directly through social media. You can do it with individuals. And what's more, it's not just about getting your messages out. You can get feedback in. And that makes the whole life of being a diplomat so much more interesting and engaging. And of course there are risks in it. I might say the wrong thing and you know, cause a scandal of some sort. But the Foreign Office is very brave in accepting that if you want to achieve something and really use an opportunity, you have to run that risk as well. So I'm very grateful to you. Oh, thank you. Uh, so not all the diplomats are learning Kyrgyz language. You, you are doing it. Uh, we heard you... Uh, uh, we, we heard your poem by uh, Alkolos Monov, and uh, yes, it's very viral. So. What are the hints to learn Kyrgyz language for English speakers? <laughs> what would you say to other people who are okay. starting? Okay, I, I think the, um, there, there are two things which I have found very difficult with Kyrgyz, and I'm sure that other English people would. One of them is the way that you build words up. So you might get a list of vocabulary, and it'll have some very short words in it, and you learn them and what they mean. And then you come across a sentence, but the word you've learned is completely hidden because there are, it, it's suddenly it's gone from being three letters long to being 15 letters long with various other things. That's a concept which you have to, which you have to get your mind around. And I haven't quite got there yet. The, the other one is this, is this sound. <laughs> right down in the throat. You know, it's tempting to use the, 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 the Russian k, but it's, um, it, it's much deeper. And it, it's, a, it's a very beautiful sound. Um, so, I mean, the, 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 the motivation is there, but it's a challenge. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, the next one is, uh, what does it mean for you to be a real diplomat, true diplomat? What are the, you know, the, what the person should be like to be a true diplomat, and why you chose to be a diplomat? Okay, that's, that's quite a tough question for 60 seconds. But, um, <laughs> um, I, I, I'll start with what I think diplomats are not. And diplomats, di diplomats are not what most people think they are. Pe 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 people say, you know, sort of, oh, you're, 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 you're a diplomat, that's such a diplomatic answer. Or, 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 they, or they call you things like your excellency. Of course, that's, that, that's the protocol, but I hate that. Because it works against what diplomats should be doing, which is having direct contact, which is why I love social media. Because it's a very democratic environment. You can, you can operate, you can communicate with people on a level. When, when people start calling you your excellency, it puts a gap in between you. Why am I excellent and you're not? You know, it's, it, it's a kind of protocol distinction which, which, which causes a problem. Um, so that's not what I think diplomats should be. I, I think the most important thing diplomats can do is to, is to bring people together, actually. It's, it, it's a convening power. Um, which, is, which is why I love events like this, because this gets people with diverse interests into one room to have a conversation, which I've certainly found interesting. I hope everyone else has as well. Yeah. That, that, that's a part of it. It's about having wider com conversations and making sure those happen. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the last one for me uh, is, <laughs> what three books had the biggest impact on your life? Right. Um, I'm going to go through, I'm going to, get, I'm going to pick a book from, from different stages of my life. Um, so, um, one of them is a series of books, they're, they're cartoon books actually, um, by a Belgian author called Hergé, 
and it's the Tintin series. Oh, I yeah. don't know if anyone's come across yeah, Tintin. I read Tintin almost non-stop from the age of about six to the age of, well, 56. And um, <laughs> certainly when I was very young, um, they had a very powerful impact on me. It was all set abroad, and it was beautifully drawn, and the ideas were, were absolutely, you know, sort of my idea about what's an exciting story of, of spies and criminals and, and goodies and baddies. And so, so Tintin was, was the, the, the one I'd mentioned from my youth. Um, later on, I would, I would have to pick something from Russian literature, actually. Um, and, and I think that when I was, I, I studied Russian at school a bit before I went to university. And when I was considering what to study at university, one of the things that really had a powerful influence was, was, was the works of Pushkin, mm -hmm. um, which I just found incredibly beautiful. And I think if I had to pick one work from Pushkin, it would be Mirny Vsadnik, which is just the most incredibly beautiful poem. And I, I feel guilty saying that, because there is so much out there. The Chekhov and the Turgenev from the Lermontov from the Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and, 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 and all the others, the, the, the modern poets as well, which are almost as beautiful. But I, I, at that particular moment, Mirny um, Vsadnik um, got it for me, I think. Um, and then later in life, um, I, I'm just going to go with a, an author who I've read um, quite a lot of recently, and that is a British author called Ian McEwan, who f has been writing novels for about 20, 30 years now, um, each of them very different but beautifully crafted novels, um, which really, for me, express um, human interaction in, 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 a, in a very poetic way. Great. Thank you very much. I uh, want to give you a present from us. Uh, but it's also, you know, it's been, it's been a great uh, dialogue because today it was a real dialogue. Thank you for, you know, I was always admiring your creativity since you came to Kyrgyzstan, even before that, because you started your activity in Twitter before. And uh, today it was also very creative because you reinvented our diplomatic dialogues. <laughs> Actually, usually we had just one-way questions to the to the diplomat, to the to the ambassador, and today you gave questions to us. And I'm sure even if we didn't answer any way these questions, we will we'll continue thinking about that. So thank you, appreciate, it. and uh, uh, just like the thing I'm wearing, yeah, Look at this. this is for you, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Charles. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, what do you think? <laughs> thank, thank, thank you all very much. I was. Um, I, I really enjoyed this evening. So I mean, thank, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for coming, and thank you for having such a sort of wonderful um, conversation. Um, do if if you want to carry it on. I'd be really happy to carry it on over social media. So. So find me and find UK and Kyrgyzstan on Facebook, Instagram, and of course on Twitter. And I, I'd be very happy to continue answering questions, hearing comments, and so on. Thank you all very much. For